one point. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, I, I've done this talk a, a few times, and sometimes we break it down into a little bit of, uh, of hip and knee. Um, today, we're just going to talk about the hip because I understand one of my uh, one of my colleagues, Eric Zekawija, has talked about the knee um, side of things uh, potentially uh, last week. So um, the the talk is titled The Hip and Knee Review 2022 because I'd like things to rhyme. And I am an orthopedic surgeon at a Valley Hospital. Um, our, our practice is located right in Ridgewood um, on South Maple Avenue. We've been here for about 40 years now. And um, we, we've over that time learned a thing or two about what works and what doesn't work. And, and sometimes the things that don't work have taught us a lot more. So um, the, the the kind of the agenda for today, and if you have, if there's any questions, I'm sure you guys can just you know type it into the Q and A. And Sue, feel feel free to interrupt, and and if, if it's something that pertains to what we're talking about, it may be just easier if I, if I answer it right away. Um, so kind of our agenda is um, we're going to talk a little bit about arthritis, um, you know, specifically about joint replacement surgeries, um, kind of the candidates and the things that we look for um, before we kind of you know um, undertake that endeavor. Um, obviously, the kind of the hot topic in the last, I would say, probably about five years has been robotics and how it pertains to what we do. Um, we'll talk about the different um, ways that you can replace a hip and different approaches that are utilized. Um, and then things that, that we've found really interesting over the last few years really has to do with what happens after the surgery is done and how do we kind of continue to, you know, make it easier for patients to get through that first, um, you know, couple of weeks when, you know, the incisions are fresh and there's kind of, you know, wound care issues and there's swelling and things that we can do to, you know, kind of make that a little bit um, more on autopilot for, for people once they get home. Um, obviously, uh, risk modification and risk assessment is a big, big deal. And it's kind of the guiding light that we have for all of our surgeries, but specifically when it comes to, you know, hip and knee replacements. Um, and then, of course, you know, because people are being, you know, discharged so quickly to home, we'll talk about some of the challenges and the reasons for why the, the, the discharge has really kind of changed from a, um, you know, acute care facility, kind of these rehab centers and nursing homes to an at home type of um, uh, healing um, location. So. Overall, sometimes I tell people is that, you know, while everybody focuses on muscles and building muscles and how we look on the beach, the important part is really the joints. The muscles themselves are just the motors, but, you know, the, the joints are what allows for motion to happen. And work in general is, is kind of transmitted and the forces are transmitted through our joints, which is why they kind of end up being the, the, the bearings that seem to kind of fail earlier. Um, as opposed to, you know, muscle tissue that's, that's very well, you know, uh, supplied with, with blood and with nourishment. So uh, any part of you that does any sort of movement um, is technically considered a joint. There's also some joints that really don't move at all, but can still be a, uh, a source of pain. Um, once a disease joint um, starts to show itself, it typically presents as one of two, um, you know, um, entities. One is that there is pain. And then two is that there's stiffness and there's limitation in motion. So once the severity of this damage becomes noticeable, people will notice that they have pain sometimes while working, sometimes while sitting, sometimes while standing or sleeping. Um, other times it's really only with, with excessive activity. And sometimes it's not even during the activity, but it's um, you know, the days that, that, that follow. Um, you know, the, the questions that I hear a lot pertaining to hip um, um, pathology or, or hip problems um, is patients will come in and oftentimes be misdiagnosed as having hernias because the pain is oftentimes felt kind of in the groin and in the, in the uh, leg crease. Um, sometimes it can be felt in the buttocks or on the side of the hips and very occasionally it can even be, um, it can radiate to the lower back if the hip has already incurred um, a large amount of stiffness. But the most common, you know, presentation is that people will feel like what they kind of pertain to as their groin or, or their inner thigh. Um, and this is usually very specific for a, um, a hip joint um, problem. Um, oftentimes people will come in and say, well, I don't have pain all the time. It's really just sometimes. And this is very common for hip osteoarthritis. Um, it's the pain doesn't have to be there all the time. And sometimes a good rule of thumb is I, I like to tell my patients, you know, to look back at the last six months. And if in those six months they can, they can, you know, recall more bad days than they have had good days. 
then it's probably um, at least a consideration to, um, to have that hip x-rayed and just to see, you know, if the, if the damage is something that's, that's uh, from the joint itself. Um, and then of course, um, you know, night pain, you know, most people I find can deal with pain during the day and, you know, basically past the age of 35, there's some level of pain that most people have in their lives. Um, but it's, it's when it starts kind of interfering with sleep that people do get more concerned because it, it's, a, it's a time where we really need to, you know, to get rest and, you know, a point where you can't really escape pain, you know, during the day, you can always take medications. I said, kind of change what you're doing, but when it comes time to sleep, there's not oftentimes, you know, a safe place to hide. Um, it is the most common cause of disability in the United States. Um, at any given time, um, about 30 million Americans are affected by osteoarthritis. Um, and while there are many different causes for joint pain, osteoarthritis, sometimes kind of referred to as the, as the wear and tear arthritis, um, is the most common. Um, other you know, alternative um, scenarios that can happen is what we call post-traumatic arthritis, which is there was an injury at some point, whether a fracture that involved a joint or damage that could have potentially left uh, you know, a permanent loss of cartilage. And once this happens, you know, we tend to kind of you know, change the, the, the name of it to what, you know, what we call post-traumatic arthritis. Um, this is to be kind of um, compared to uh, inflammatory arthritis. The most common inflammatory arthritis is, uh, is rheumatoid arthritis, but it's not the only one. Um, Rheumatoid arthritis um, is a very specific entity that affects um, the immune system and essentially causes the body to um, miss kind of um, target some of our, our native tissues for um, invaders. And essentially it turns um, your body's immune system against you. Um, it, it is common and it seems to be more common in women, at least in the earlier ages. And as, as you know, kind of the population gets older, men will kind of have this later presentation. Um, but uh, it, it is disabling enough that it's led to a whole number of, uh, of, of medical and, uh, and you know, medications to be um, um, engineered by the pharmaceutical industry. And, and these days, those medicines work very, very well. And very few people actually go to surgery um, uh, when it comes to rheumatoid arthritis. Um, other inflammatory arthritis include psoriatic arthritis. Um, there are, um, you know, things that, that are termed, you know, bacterial um, but even after the bacteria has kind of left the body, some of the small proteins can be also misrepresented um, and the body can attack um, um, tissues and native tissues as well. Um, what does a arthritic and healthy hip look like? Well, you know, these are just some of the pictures, you know, as, as kind of cartoonish as we can make them um, to show you uh, what the process is. So cartilage itself, if you look at, let me see if I have a pointer. Um, Oh, nope, I don't have a pointer, but uh, on the, on the left-hand side, the healthy hip, you can see that every one of our bones, every one of the joints is actually covered by a layer of cartilage. Um, that cartilage layer is somewhere between four to six millimeters thick. Um, and that's all we get for our entire lives. And while most tissues have the ability to heal, cartilage um, doesn't have the blood supply to be able to heal itself. So once damage occurs, it's very, very unlikely that it's gonna heal or be able to replace itself. Um, it's, it's the reason why joints um, are well protected, um, but it's also the reason why joints oftentimes um, incur damage and it tends to be kind of like a degenerative process or a one-way road. So the arthritic hip will show kind of that cap at the end of, at, at the top of the femur, um, essentially wearing down, um, fissuring, um, some kind of you know, exposed bone uh, presenting itself. And eventually things that are uh, visible on, on x-rays um, shows up. So a normal x-ray shows a nice concentric joint space, which means that the thickness of that space between the socket and the, and the head is um, just about exactly the same. Um, there are no um, kind of you know, changes to the native head shape. It looks like a perfect circle and that's what it should be. Um, there's no bone spurs and there's no cystic changes. And when you compare that to an arthritic hip, you can see all of those four aforementioned um, kind of findings. You know, you see these large kind of cystic, it almost looks like little holes in the bone. Um, there's sclerosis, which is the white part around the bone that is thicker bone bone that's actually gotten um, stronger over time through, you know, fractures that have happened and, and the wear patterns. 
Uh, but then you also see that the hip is no longer concentric inside of the, the shell. It's actually starting to kind of migrate, you know, upward and outward, um, which is what we call subluxation or, or, you know, a kind of the attempt for the hip to, to kind of slip out of the socket. And then, of course, um, you know, the final finding, which is bone spurs, um, which can oftentimes be a limiting um, a limit to motion and how much native motion a hip has. So, um, you know, it, it's always important just to mention that, you know, while we like to talk about the surgical side of things and as a surgeon, you know, that that becomes the kind of the, you know, the 50 percent of my life. The vast majority of people that come to our office um, do not end up with surgery for, for hip arthritis, um, partly because it may be too early, uh, partly because there may be some uh, modifiable risk factors that we can improve upon, and partly because not all of the, of the conventional non-operative um, treatments have been tried. Um, and these things do work. And while this is a degenerative condition, sometimes that I like to remind my patients in the office that so much of the success of these surgeries has to do with the timing of them, uh, meaning that unless the uh, x-rays show what we see here as bone on bone, um, a hip replacement doesn't always alleviate all of the pain because in an arthritic hip, it's not just the surface that's the pain generator. There are ligaments, muscles, nerves, you know, tendons that are all affected by kind of the degenerative process the hip replacement will fix only the pain that's emanating from the bones essentially scraping against each other. So while somebody can have osteoarthritis, um, sometimes the timing of the surgery is the critical part and it has to do with the success that people can um, ultimately achieve. So important things to mention are obviously diet and low impact exercises, um, walking aids, um, nobody, ever wants to hear um, that I'd like to put them on a cane or a walker. Um, but things that they do seem to be a little bit more open to is walking sticks or trekking poles. You know, it, it kind of, it, it's less taboo. It's, it's more activity focused. Um, but the idea is the same, you know, by limiting how much of the joint reactive force um, the hip experiences, um, we can sometimes take away some of the pressure and allow people to kind of break through some of those um, flares that can sometimes um, occur and, and at least buy them some time to either get, you know, better, you know, optimization for the surgery or just allow them time because people, you know, it requires a lot of time to allow these hips to heal. And there's just, you know, weddings that we have to get to and there's, you know, vacations and sometimes buying a little bit of time is, is the right thing to do. Um, medications are kind of the, the cornerstone of, of how we treat a degenerating hip. Um, it does not mean that you are going to be on lifelong medications, but there are certain kind of, um, flares that can happen that are well controlled using both steroidal and non-steroidal, uh, medications. So non-steroidal medications that we've all, you know, grown accustomed to are the Advils, the leaves of the world, um, Tylenols, you know, no matter how much, um, I think, you know, Bayer or whoever owns Tylenol now loves to advertise. Um, it is not an anti-inflammatory medication. And no matter how big they put the Tylenol for arthritis sign, um, it doesn't do, you know, a great job at controlling um, arthritis pain by itself. Um, you know, other things that oftentimes, you know, come up are, are cortisone injections. And while they work well in the knee, uh, in the hip, they tend to have a little bit less, you um, uh, efficacy in terms of like the longevity of, of the response. So sometimes you'll find that we don't necessarily rely on them as much. Um, they're more for diagnostic reasons um, than they are for any um, long-term treatment options. They are available and they can be um, used. Um, physical therapy is the last thing I just want to mention. Um, this really just has to do with motion. You know, uh, healthy joints have healthy muscles and they have healthy motion um, um, kind of imparted to them through those muscles. Once we start losing that motion, our tendency is that the hip starts to hurt and we tend to kind of protect it even more. And it kind of, you know, begins this spiral where more pain causes less motion, less motion causes more pain. And it kind of goes down the wrong pathway that sometimes, you know, working with a physical therapist is, is, is extremely helpful because they can help restore some of the motion. And up until a certain point, motion is a very, very um, effective tool for battling, um, you know, discomfort and pain that can be experienced by, by um, hip osteoarthritis. Um, and then, you know, the one thing that's always worth mentioning is that, is that, well, there are great non-operative options and people tend to 
really hold on to these as much as they can. There's also a whole you know, plethora of modalities that are out there that have not really been validated through science. And while they may work, um, it's hard for me as a, as a doctor of science to, 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 um, to recommend these things. Oftentimes, um, there, there's a substantial out-of-pocket cost to patients. Um, sometimes, you know, the kind of the vagueness of about like how long this therapy should work, you know, should take to work is kind of the, the, the kind of the curtain that that's, that's left kind of covering, you know, you know, a patient's, you know, vision, because to me, when, if something is going to work, it should have a fairly, you know, noticeable, you know, temporal relationship, you know, a treatment is performed and, and within a few weeks, there should be a benefit. Um, some of these things, you know, will, patients are told will take, you know, six months to work. There's multiple injections always involved. Um, it shouldn't be that complex. So some of these things for hip arthritis, I always kind of like just mentioned to people um, are hard to be treated by any of these kind of, you know, modalities that we see here. Um, you know, so with that said, um, you know, what exactly is a hip replacement? Um, well, a hip replacement is a very, very successful operation. Um, and, and when it comes to medical kind of, um, breakthroughs, um, I'll say this, you know, there's a study that, that took place in, a, in, a, in before 2007, but it was published in The Lancet. And, you know, for anybody who knows anything about just some of the medical literature that's out there, The Lancet is kind of the world's New England Journal of Medicine. It's kind of the, you know, the, the pinnacle of, of, uh, of validated data. And it takes a lot of, you know, you know, research rigor to be able to publish in, in The Lancet. And in 2007, so now that's 15 years ago, The Lancet actually published an article that said that the operation of the century is not a, you know, brain, you know, deep brain stimulation. It's not a heart transplant. It's not, you know, uh, you know, arm and, you know, facial transplants and all these things that we kind of see in the media. Um, it's actually a hip replacement because for the risk to benefit ratio, there's nothing that even comes close to it. Um, you know, overall, at, at least 95% of hip replacements are doing well at 10 years. And kind of the number that I always mention to people is that on average, it's a 1% per year revision rate. So when people ask us how long will the hip replacement last, the real answer is, is that 20 years from now, you have a, you know, one in five chance of having had a revision for any, any reason whatsoever. So, you know, because the, the, the surgery works so well, um, it is approximately accounts for um, uh, one third of all the joint replacements that we do. Um, it still accounts for close to half a million joint replacements. And that, that number is exponentially um, uh, has been growing um, as little as in 2015. Uh, that number was about 250,000. Um, over those last seven years, it's gone up to 400,000. And it is expected to, to um, get to over a million by the end of um, 2029 20, uh, or 2030. So it, it is a significant, you know, burden of disease that, that orthopedists um, and, and, and primary care physicians will be um, um, tackling in the next, you know, decade. So this is kind of a, what a hip replacement is. And I'll try to pause it. You can see that the arthritic hip shows um, the, the wearing away of the cartilage, the cystic change and the not smooth surface is visible. So that head is removed. The first part of the surgery uh, typically involves kind of resurfacing the socket because that side of the joint is also damaged just through friction. Um, that side is replaced through an acetabular or shell, which is made of titanium. Um, oftentimes, no uh, need for any sort of cement or adjuvant fixation is needed. These are all ingrowth surfaces. There's a plastic liner that's made out of um, high durability polyethylene that's placed inside the cup. The stem goes inside the femur and a uh, now ceramic ball, this is a metal ball here, is uh, articulated with that stem. And this essentially reconstructs or recreates the hip joint, again, with much lower friction and, uh, and, and ultimately the hope is um, no pain. And let's see. So, you know, what are these hip replacements made of? Um, so we've gone through a number of iterations and um, some have not taken us down a fruitful pathway. Some have caused harm. But in the last, I would say, almost 20 years now, um, the data has kind of overwhelmingly left us with what we call a ceramic on poly um, hip replacement. What that means is that we have a uh, titanium-based acetabular shell that, that a plastic liner can clip into. Um, there's a titanium stem um, and a ceramic head. And uh, what this allows for is a smooth surface that more than anything is modular. 
So if there comes a time where the hip, where the plastic piece wears out, um, which at this rate is about 0.1 millimeters per year. So a four millimeter shell can theoretically still last for about 40 years. Um, so um, if, if anything needs to be exchanged, sometimes leaving the metal parts, the, the titanium parts um, is way more, um, way less morbidity for the patients. And we can use the modularity of these implants to essentially give you a brand new hip without ever having to take out all of the implants, which is what we term revision surgeries. So now um, robots, um, while they are not as colorful and um, fun as some of the, the Pixar uh, depictions, um, they have made their way into orthopedics as well. Um, this is how our robots look like. And while there's been a few iterations, this is kind of the most ergonomic um, method for us to, to use this machine. Um, it can be used for knee replacements, for hip replacements, for partial knee replacements. And the hope is in times for some of the other ortho orthopedic surgeries, including uh, fracture fixation and potentially even uh, ACL and some of the, the sports types of surgeries. Um, and the way that it works is, well, this is the one thing I always kind of mention. Um, there are always going to be people out there that love to kind of, um, you know, say, well, you know, my surgery works pretty well. Why do I need to, you know, kind of, um, you know, rely on robots? You know, the, the, there is a higher expense to the, to the medical system. There's a, you know, theoretic, you know, possibility that the robot can malfunction. So why would I need to use something um, that, that's trying to, you know, recreate um, the wheel effectively as, as our surgeries have done well, you know, for years before the robot? Well, what I like to always kind of mention to people is that there was a time where a rotary phone was the standard and, and it makes a phone call just like everybody else's cell phone does now. Um, you know, you can say that the phone at that time worked just as well as it, as it does today. Same thing about these cameras that we have. But we know that these two technologies have continued to improve and it has led us to, you know, just about, you know, a personal computer in our pockets. And, in, in a, I know for myself um, included, it is, um, it is a critical part to my, you know, my practice, to my ability to kind of communicate with patients. And ultimately, um, it's, it's made things better and easier. And that's kind of what I tell people about using a robot is that, you don't have to use it, but I certainly find it easier for me. And I find that my patients are able to recover faster because I can, you know, reproducibly uh, show them what we've talked about um, in the office as a, as a likely outcome. So um, the Mako hip is a 3d templating software. That's, that's kind of um, inner inner lock to a robotic assisted reaming device. Um, what this allows us to do is that it allows us to prepare the bone in the most efficient way possible and also minimize any sort of uh, malpositioning that can lead to poor outcomes and, and, and an untimely failure of a hip replacement. So um, what a hip you know, replacement patient might look like on an x-ray is what you see here on the right side. You can see that that joint space has narrowed substantially. We have the, the sclerotic changes, which is the whitening the, the, um, the bone spurs, which are growing at the inferior part of the head. And then of course, you know, the, um, the, the uh, cystic change in the sclerosis that's visible. So in the past, we used to essentially, originally just use templates that we would put against flat films. And we would try to guess as much as we could using a two-dimensional image, what a three-dimensional, you know, socket or, or stem would look like. And while this worked, you know, there was always some level of uncertainty because it was hard to know what the pelvis did when the person stood up. It was hard to imagine the three-dimensional kind of nature of a very complicated, um, you know, shape, you know, uh, bone. Um, and, you know, what, what the robot has allowed us to do is to really kind of focus on these functional implant positioning where not everybody's pelvis moves the same way and being able to predict how it moves will also mitigate any sort of, um, uh, dislocations um, that can happen or potentially fractures. Um, so instead of using two-dimensional software, we're now using three-dimensional CAT scans. We, we can effectively build a 3D model of the pelvis, and then we can program the robot as to which part of the bone needs to be removed so that we can put the correct kind of facing um, socket in place. Um, and this is what happens in the operating room. So what I like to tell patients is that your surgery will be completed two weeks before you even set foot in the operating room because we will have programmed the robot and we would have um, kind of positioned our implants into the most appropriate um, kind of location. Um, so the day of operation, it's really just executing a plan. You know, this is how our hip looks like. So you can see that it's a very, you know, abnormal appearing bone. 
Um, people can have large spurs that can make you think that you're putting the implant in the correct position, but oftentimes you're not. So when you look at a three-dimensional view, it's much easier to kind of visualize that we're putting the, the socket in the right um, location. And some of these numbers that you see right there, the 40, 25, 4, 7, 4, are, are the kind of the, the tolerances that, that we allow for. So you can see that we have control of, of, a, of a millimeter of, of precision and, and even a, a degree of rotation. And while I like to think that I am a very good surgeon, um, I could not compare my visual acuity to that of a robot, uh, um, and that would be foolish to, to, to think that uh, you could. So then these are some of the things that we have to kind of take into consideration when we put these things in. The time for surgery is really this. So this is what the robot looks like, and this is the reaming device that allows us to remove that bone. So while this is a robotic surgery, it's really a robotically assisted surgery. So I'm still in full control of that device. It just the machine will shut off if, if I try to do something that was not in my plan. Um, and this is one of my, this is one of my partners doing um, a hip replacement. And you can see that he is in full control of that robotic arm. Um, that arm is inside of the pelvis. And, you know, because we have essentially built a virtual haptic kind of boundary for that um, acetabular shell, there's, there's no worry about, you know, vessel injury or, or damaging the bone or over reaming or putting it in the wrong position because essentially the robot has been programmed to not allow the, you know, you know, those scenarios to happen. All right. All right. And you can see right now, oh, no, I, I thought it was going to show the reaming, but I think it stopped. But, and then after surgery, we can reproducibly place our implants in a way that, that we expected. So, you know, has this technology helped? Well, you know, at best, we've done studies with, with fellowship trained, very, very good surgeons. And at best, they were able to replicate what we call the safe zone for, for uh, implant placement 80% of the time. And it's kind of, uh, it's not a coincidence that just about one out of, you know, five hip replacements would always kind of have this like unsatisfied, you know, feel just like some of our knee replacements. So because of that, you know, this is why the technology, um, was created. And there are studies now that say it is 100% accurate for getting us into that safe zone. Now, whether or not the safe zone is the correct safe zone, that's now kind of the next frontier and what we're trying to um, figure out. But it's a, this, is a, this has really kind of given us a head start to, um, to, that, to that concept. Um, you know, patient outcomes have obviously shown um, uh, improvement and now length of stays in the hospital is, um, is, is sometimes less than a, than a few hours. Um, and then, you know, the other thing I always mention is that as a surgeon, I, I, I can tell you right now that I feel safer with this technology. And sometimes that's really just kind of where the rubber meets the road. You know, if the person that's putting the implants in feels that there's just feels that there's a benefit, then there probably is no matter what a study may, may or may not show. Um, and again, this is, this was our, our patient. This was our plan. This is how the templated software made our plan look. So this is not an actual x-ray. This is what the robot um, essentially kind of created as a post-operative um, um, outcome. And then when we compare it to our outcome, you can see that it looks very, very similar and very reproducible. So um, other than that, you know, these are just some of the advantages of the specific kind of Mako robot, which is a striker, um, you know, proprietary um, uh, piece of technology. Um, other than that, um, I just wanted to briefly kind of touch on the approaches, you know, um, because there's a tendency for patients to think that there are, there's a better approach to the hip replacement. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, people come in and say, oh, I heard that there's a new approach to the hip replacement that is better. Um, sometimes what I like to remind people is that if there was a better approach, there would only be one approach. So there are multiple approaches that surgeons can use effectively to replace a hip and all of these surgeries can have an excellent, excellent outcome as long as the implants are put in correctly. So less important is the approach that we use, more important are the indications, the optimization of the patient, and, and our ability to put in our implants reproducibly. Uh, and, and that's kind of why I think the robotics has really kind of opened up a good pathway. So, you know, the, the big kind of like elephant in the room are these kind of anterior hip replacements that are looked at as, you know, the newer way of doing a hip replacement. 
Um, I always like to remind people that this is actually the older way of doing a hip replacement. Um, the first hip replacement was done, was done through an anterior approach. And that was the typical way that we would put hips in for a long time. Um, the problem was, is that it was very risky and there were a lot of complications that came from it. So patient, so surgeons essentially switched over to it, uh, some of the more traditional approaches. Um, but, you know, sometimes, you know, marketing can do a, a big kind of like, um, you know, it can change the way that we think about things. And sometimes I always like to, you know, remind people that, you know, you have to trust your doctors because they live and breathe these things. And while I do enjoy doing anterior approaches, there are plenty of patients that I think will just have a safer, easier outcome with, you know, with a posterior or a lateral or a superior approach um, um, as, as seen fit. So um, the last thing just really just has to do with um, kind of dressings. Um, we've really moved away from using staples or any sort of um, suture material um, because every you know stitch that's placed is a theoretically a nidus for infection. So in our practice, we've kind of moved over to using um, some of these skin sealants as a way to uh, prevent bacteria from entering the joint, but also to prevent any sort of drainage issues which can happen. So you know, don't be surprised if you never see a stitch or a stitch is never removed from your hip. Um, an incision was still made. It's just that we have you know better ways of healing it now. Um, and when it comes to kind of risk factors, um, not everybody should have a hip replacement at this particular time. And oftentimes it kind of comes to like the patient's, you know, overall, you know, physique and the patient's health status. So some of the, you know, certainly, you know, kind of no fly, you know, um, issues that can happen, uh, it has to do with smoking. Um, so smoking must be stopped, you know, diabetes should be controlled, you know, theoretically the number is less than eight, but we kind of tend to tell people shoot for less than seven and a half, um, because this just provides for a healthier healing environment. Um, narcotic pain medications should not be used prior to surgery. They will not help and they will also make your recovery harder. Um, and then if there are any other mitigating circumstances, high body weight index, um, you know, potentially some um, immune modulating mod, uh, medications, those would also have to be stopped prior to surgery. Um, and then of course, discharge, you know, we've gotten to a point where most patients can actually go home the same day safely. Um, you know, and this will be a conversation to have with your surgeon. Um, these surgeries have been done in outpatient settings for, I would say, you know, 15 years now. But the more data has come out, you know, Medicare is eventually kind of as the number one payer for these surgeries has shifted their model to the same idea. So every hip replacement and every knee replacement is technically considered an outpatient surgery, which means that a hospital cannot admit you as an inpatient unless there's a medical need for it, which oftentimes blocks the pathway to rehab centers for patients. Uh, there's a reason for this. Rehab centers are very expensive. Um, so the, the, the Medicare system cannot handle this kind of volume that's coming down the line. And they're also um, very well established that they have worse outcomes. You know, people assume that they will go to a rehab center and be doing, you know, gym exercises every day, Many places are underfunded. They don't have enough support staff. You'll probably get up, you know, two times in a day to walk with a therapist. And oftentimes it's, it's less kind of glamorous than, than it seems. And then when it's coupled with the ideas of higher infection rates, higher fall, higher fracture risks, um, oftentimes, you know, the, the, the attitude in our office is that, you know, if, if, you are not healthy enough to have to be able to go home after surgery, then potentially you're not healthy enough to have the surgery. And, you know, while it may sound a little bit callous, you know, these are very, very complicated, you know, surgeries that if a complications happens, um, it can be multiple, multiple surgeries. And, you know, potentially the risks may not be warranted by, you know, by um, kind of pushing the limits um, sometimes. So other than that, I think that wraps up my didactic session and I am open to questions. If anybody has any specific questions um, that, that may be helpful to, uh, to the whole group. Thank you so much, doctor. That was um, so comprehensive, very interesting um, and, and uh, very encouraging, you know, cause surgery is so daunting for many people and to hear it um, described in this manner is, is comforting. Um, just, you know, it's just amazing to me. Um, I used to work in discharge planning and even worked at a rehab or two. And gosh, historically, <laughs> that was what you did, right? You went in for a couple of days and went to rehab. And I'm so glad that it's, it's such a different um, uh, kind of uh, 
um, you know, process right now. That's that's so much more helpful. Um, so just, I know you kind of mentioned this, what is the recovery post-operative typically about? Like, could you kind of just talk about that a little bit? I, I think uh, hip replacements are actually very kind of standardized and even the recovery is, is very, very kind of like the, the average kind of like the bell curve is very, very narrow, which means that I can like just about precisely, you know, describe somebody's recovery. And then also notice when somebody's not kind of following that curve. Um, typically, most patients have pain for about two to three weeks after the surgery, and the pain seems to kind of peak somewhere in the first week and then substantially improves. Um, this is kind of the area like while, while the body is kind of figuring out what happened. So for most patients, I just tell them for the first two to three weeks, there's not much physical therapy that can help you get there faster. It's really just about uh, resuscitating the tissue. So it's really go slow, use a walking aid if you can, um, ice it take the pain medications and just get comfortable in terms of like the surgery by the time the incision heals, which is somewhere between um, week two to week three, most patients are, are fairly independent at that point. Um, driving can occur somewhere between week two and I'm sorry, week three and week four. And for most patients, my expectation is when they come in at the six week mark, their pain may be somewhere on an arbitrary scale of one to 10, somewhere between a one and a two. Many people will come in and if they're well indicated, will actually say, I, I have no pain whatsoever right now, you know, and then it takes another two to three months after that for the implants to become, you know, fully seated. But by six weeks, I allow most patients to get back to activities um, without any, you know, precautions or any, any uh, reservations. Great. Uh, another question. Do you see many patients with uh, a vascular necrosis of the hip, AVN? Yeah. So, so, you know, osteoarthritis is still kind of like the number one reason why patients um, go, uh, go for surgery or degenerative arthritis. So something broke down the cartilage, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, post-traumatic, the things that we talked about. The number two reason in, in this country is AVN. It's the number one reason in, in uh, some of the Asian countries, but it's the number two reason in the United States. So if the blood supply stops to the femoral head, the cartilage will eventually die as will the bone. Um, so it is a very common reason for why people end up with hip replacements, um, and it doesn't really change the surgery much. Um, sometimes I do remind patients that it takes a little bit longer to recover from that scenario, uh, but not much. You know, most people somewhere between week six and week eight are going to be fully satisfied. And um, typically, it, you know, is there prescribed physical therapy after operation? And if so, how long is that typical course of PT? Um, not, not usually. Most patients, 80% um, of patients actually um, won't, will not require any physical therapy. Um, the physical therapy that's sometimes required has to do with some of the more elderly patients who've waited a long time and the muscles have actually atrophied around the hip. So, you know, for most people, they will never do a day of physical therapy. They'll get through the hip replacement and they'll go back to their regular kind of activities and gym. Um, but there's always a small subset of patients that I tell that if at six weeks, I see that you still have a little bit of a limp, there's a little bit of a difficulty navigating stairs, getting up from a chair. Um, those are the patients that at six weeks, I will actually refer um, for physical therapy. Amazing. And finally, I think you touched on this, but as far as anesthesia general versus, is it usually general anesthesia and, or is there a different type of, uh, anesthesia used? That's a really good question. It's actually very rare that we, uh, that we have true general anesthesia where somebody has to be intubated and on a respirator, on a ventilator. Um, the vast majority of these surgeries are done using um, local anesthesia. So, you know, the most kind of effective way of blocking pain is to just block the sensors of pain. You know, sometimes I tell people, even though you're under general anesthesia and the brain is not awake, um, your body still feels pain. And then we see it on monitors. We, we can actually see heart rate go up. We can see anxiety, um, even though somebody's technically asleep and not, you know, be able to um, recall that. Um, so the best way to do this is what we call multimodal anesthesia. So it's, you know, spinal anesthetic will kind of numb the body's feeling of what's happening. So it doesn't know what's happening. We pre-medicate patients with, you know, anti-inflammatory medications, with steroids, with, you know, um, Tylenol, with, um, you know, sometimes even like, you know, some of these gabapentinoid medications for nerves so that when the body wakes up, there's actually medications on board that prevent it from having this kind of inflammatory reaction. 
we add a little bit of our own local kind of numbing medication to the incision just to kind of get you through the first couple of days. But the idea is that it's more important to kind of focus on these non-narcotic medications as, a, as the mainstay of, of, uh, of healing. And, you know, what the spinal anesthetic from the surgical perspective is just a small kind of um, branch on a much bigger kind of pain tree that we're trying to, you know, re redesign and, and kind of move away from the narcotics. Um, there's still a role for them and they are important in the first, you know, I would say maybe two weeks, but it is a very, very small window where, where that medicine will actually help. So are you saying that the patient's typically awake for this surgery, doctor? Um, if they want to be, they can be. So, you know, the, the one person so far has actually asked to stay awake. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, most people just, they, they don't want to be like cognizant of what's happening, even if, even if they can't feel it. Um, but if, 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 if there's anxiety about actually falling asleep, you are fully capable of like staying awake for the entire surgery. You can listen to our music. You can talk to us. You can talk to the anesthesiologist um, and, and you wouldn't experience any pain. Amazing. Um, and how long does the surgery typically take for a pretty typical? Pretty, uh, pretty routine hip replacement and knee replacement is basically an hour. It's an hour long surgery. Yeah. Okay, great. And somebody just, oh, somebody said, thank you so much. That was great. And hold on one more. Um, is, do you, have you found that sciatic pain in the buttock is related to the hip? Um, so it, it the hip will never um, cause sciatica, uh -huh. um, but sometimes what happens is that people will feel what they think is sciatica and it's actually hip pain. So sciatica is very, very specific. It, it shoots and it radiates and it's an all or nothing kind of response that will kind of go down the back of the leg. Uh, people can feel buttock pain. Um, and while it's not technically, you know, sciatica, uh, it could be just inflammation that's kind of being created from the hip and kind of pushed backwards. Sometimes tendons can give the feeling of, of sciatica. Sometimes um, the actual hip arthritis can also do it. Um, and then sometimes while it doesn't cause sciatica, it can, um, it can uncover it. So if, if a hip is very stiff, that force has to go somewhere. The next joint over is your spine. So sometimes, you know, patients with very, very bad hips tend to have bad backs because the arthritic process is the same, but it's actually that the stiff hip is causing you to change the way that you're walking and that can kind of fire off a, an irritated nerve in the back, which is sometimes why I tell people I cannot guarantee it, but sometimes back pain, low back pain can actually improve following a hip replacement. It's, it's not something that, you know, I, you should really advertise, but it's, it's a known kind of a secondary benefit. And finally, have you seen um, anybody, it's interesting, um, who's had COVID that's had more bone pain or more hip pain or any relation in your practice? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, you know, I've seen things that I've seen is that, um, and it's sometimes related to, to vaccinations too. And it's not really a way of to discourage vaccines because I think the benefit is huge. Um, but anything that can kind of wake up your immune system has the potential to also wake up some of the, some of the kind of the inflammatory conditions that we have, because the, the process is the same. What causes inflammation are white blood cells. What fights infections are white blood cells. So inflammatory conditions or anything that kind of like provokes inflammation can sometimes aggravate um, underlying disease processes. It will never cause arthritis, but it sometimes it's a little window into what's happening already. So, you know, while COVID won't necessarily cause um, an arthritic hip, um, it can wake it up. With that said, somebody asked a question earlier about avascular necrosis. Um, I've had a few patients actually present with multifocal avascular necrosis related to COVID because um, the, the virus itself is prothrombotic. So it can cause either blood clots, but it can also cause clotting of small, of the small arteries in your body. And when that happens in the shoulders, the hips, the knees, um, you can actually um, end up killing the blood supply. And that can lead to a hip replacement or a knee replacement or a shoulder replacement in the future. 
Wow. Um, and just can we, I'm sorry, it's only 10 to three. I just want to ask you another question about someone who yeah. says, is it normal seven weeks post-op, um, they're pain-free, but still have leg or ankle swelling? Have you seen that? Yes, yes. S swelling can, can persist for honestly up to seven months. And I don't consider it concerning um, because it tends to resolve. Um, the usual reason is because the actual... Um, there's underlying veins that may be already a little bit damaged, um, but it can certainly present. And I typically tell people that as long as if you elevate the leg, if the swelling gets better and there's not a clear blood clot, um, that swelling will resolve with time. And, and also, do you know of any activity restrictions uh, at all after fully recovering and healing from the surgery, running or any, anything at all that you know of? Um, the biggest, um, the biggest kind of, um, thing that I tell people is this is not a living part of you, right? It's wearable. And eventually if you live long enough and you're active enough, it will wear out what that, how somebody kind of understands that comment is very, very different, right? So I have patients who are marathon runners and this is what's important to them. Am I telling him not to run a marathon? I'm not telling him not to run, but I'm, I'm telling him that they have to be aware that they will most likely wear out their implants sooner. An implant that heals well should not loosen through these types of activities, but there's obviously limits to what a, an artificial joint can do. So, you know, if you're into yoga or you're into bungee jumping and you have an implant inside of you that's potentially capable of separating and potentially jumping out, there's certain kind of common sense that, that, that would, you know, behoove you to try to limit certain things. There's certain yoga poses that I have a hard time doing now. I imagine if I have a hip replacement, it would be unsafe to do that. Um, in terms of, you know, high level sports, um, you know, the surgeries are, they're good fake joints, but they're still not normal joints. And sometimes, you know, the expectation is that I'm getting my 20 year old knee back or my 20 year old hip back. The hip will feel very normal. And most people will kind of forget that they had a hip replacement, but it's still not a normal joint. And sometimes just kind of, you know, listening to the surgeon as to what we consider safe activities afterward, it's probably good for your long-term, you know, health in general. So things that I allow for patients is hiking, you know, short duration running, um, sp spinning, uh, elliptical, swimming, um, you know, even tennis, skiing, all these things can be done. But if somebody just says, I like to run for, you know, 10 miles a day, four times a week, like you're, you will probably wear out that joint, you know, sooner than expected. And, and just one more question about cortisone shots. Yeah, um, that's the one I'm reading. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> couple about, do they work? Uh, how often can you have them? And I would say that, you know, a, a cortisone injection in the hip, I find can sometimes work up to a month. Um, if it's true arthritis, if it's a little bit of synovitis or just joint inflammation, it can, it can stop the process altogether. But for a truly arthritic hip um, that is looking at a hip replacement, um, I find that it works somewhere between two to four weeks. Um, and really, if, if, if you need the injection more often than that, that it's probably time to start thinking about a joint replacement. Um, you know, corticosteroid injections can sometimes be placed in the hip, but it's not actually in the joint. So that there's also always kind of a question to ask, well, where is this cortisone going? Is it going on the side of my hip? Is it going around the tendon? Or is it going inside of my joint where the cartilage is? And if, if it's being done routinely inside of the joint, Typically, we, re we allow patients to do that once we know that they are already looking at a hip replacement, you know, but on, on a hip that's moderate arthritis or mild arthritis, I would probably encourage you not to do that any more often than once a year, you know, if, if that even. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, doctor. This was so interesting. Thank you for taking the time to answer so many 